Donald J. Trump, hero to progressives. Hi, I'm Scott Ott, and this is Bill Whittle Now. And Bill, there's an interesting column on CNN.com by a guy named John Blake, outlining in great detail how President Trump has probably been the best thing to happen to the progressive movement since Franklin Roosevelt. And it's a long list of reasons that he believes this, but let me just uh, touch on a couple of them to start off here. Uh, primarily, it's built around this idea that there has been a what he calls a Trump lash, which is a backlash against President Trump's policies, his rhetoric, his demeanor, and a lot of other aspects of his behavior. Um, and he even says that it looks like President Trump is some sort of a double agent, using conservative rhetoric from the Oval Office, but at the same time behaving in ways that generate this reaction. Progressive ideas are at a 60-year high in popularity. Bill, what do you think of this thesis? I think if it hadn't been for Donald Trump, uh, progressive values would be at a 100-year high. Uh, they'd be at, the, at, at a high that is unexcelled in the history of the republic, and that we would basically not even be having a discussion like this. Um, there is no question that there's some backlash in terms of some, it seems to me, relatively insignificant people on the borders I don't know of anybody, anecdotally, that doesn't mean it's true, but but nevertheless, the number of people that I know that didn't vote for Trump in 2016 and will be voting for him enthusiastically in 2020 is enormous. I don't know anybody who voted for him in 2016 and will not be voting for him in 2020. So when he talks about a, a backlash, what he's talking about is a is a backlash among the people that he hangs out with who are no doubt incensed at Trump and uh, and uh, motivated maybe in a way they never were under uh, Barack Obama. But I don't think the American people fall into that category as a general rule. Well, his suggestion is that voter turnout surged in the 2018 midterm elections. Um, and part of that was due to the backlash against President Trump and that the Obama coalition, so-called, kind of fell apart um, in 2016. So it wasn't there for Hillary Clinton. But frankly, what Donald Trump is saying and doing is getting the band back together. And he thinks the 2020 election will represent a record high for turnout among Democrats and progressives. As we've discussed many times before, uh, there may be a record turnout of Democrats and progressives, but they're not going to be voting for the same person. There's not going to be a record turnout uh, of Democrats and progressives, Scott, I don't think, because I don't see how half of the party gets up to vote that day. There are people who, who there are Democrats who are like solidly behind Joe Biden because he, he seems to them to be the last sensible candidate. There are people who would never vote for Joe Biden. He's an old white male and he has no SJW uh, credentials. And so uh, I think that the Democratic Party is split on the rocks. And to say that Hillary Clinton didn't get the benefit of, of the Obama coalition, I don't know how you possibly say that. I mean, I really don't. Hillary Clinton's uh, uh, Hillary Clinton had the nomination to say she had it sewn up is an understatement. Her, um, her entire campaign was predicated on the idea of, a, of an easy victory no matter who the Republican challenger was going to be. All of the tides of history and momentum in the first woman and this and that, glass ceilings, all this stuff was running in her favor. And then along comes Donald Trump, who, um, to say the very, very least about it, upset the apple cart a little bit and took the progressive movement off the rails. For this guy to say that Donald Trump's the best thing that happened to the progressive party is, is, is just it, it's just plain wishful thinking, and it's and it's it's a form of of rationalizing the fact that the progressive movement under uh, under eight years of Barack Obama was smoothly heading towards another eight years under Madam Clinton, and with all of the uh, assets they had going for them in terms of the the complete ownership of the mainstream media, ownership of elements of the government that we've never seen politicized before. In fact, on the contrary, we're always above politics. To think that that somehow um, they're going to do better in 2020 than they did in 2016 is is beyond my understanding, and I think it's yet another one of these keep your chin up kind of uh, things uh, that that desperate people are are writing to um, 
convince themselves that they still have some relevancy in the country. Well, Bill, this John Blake at CNN.com is making a couple of arguments, some of which seem to be at war with themselves. In one sense, Imagine. he's saying that President Trump um, actually helped progressives by, by campaigning on saying he would never cut Social Security like so many Republicans uh, have suggested. And he points out that during the Obama administration, President Obama actually was trying to reform Social Security that would involve some kinds of cuts or, or or increases in um, the age at which you start to receive Social Security. And so when Obama said his model for government reform was Ronald Reagan, um, the progressives much prefer this Donald Trump who's coming in and saying, oh, we're not going to touch your Social Security. And that seems to endorse the idea that big government is a good thing and will take care of you. Well, needless to say, there's an awful lot about Donald Trump that I that I think could use improvement. And, and his attitude towards spending, I think, would probably put top of the list. But, but for you know, he, he really is dealing in, in, a, in a situation where he's talking about, I think, his own peers and his own colleagues. So that begs the question, um, when we would make a similar statement back in the Obama administration, that statement would be that Barack Obama is the best gun salesman that ever lived in America. More people bought guns because of Barack Obama than anybody in, in history. And I think that's indisputable. The question is, is the, is the metric there? Is it... It's certainly true in the case of gun sales. I mean, that's just a hard figure. There's no, no doubt about it. So the question is, is, is the country becoming more progressive? Are these progressive values taking root? And in fact, are they taking root and accelerating their growth because of Donald Trump? The evidence is against him, sad to say. Progressive values have been put into Star Wars, and Star Wars is a dead franchise. Progressive values have been put into Star Trek. Star Trek is a dead franchise. Progressive values have been put into Marvel Comics. Marvel Comics is a dead franchise. Every time that the NFL opens its mouth about progressive values, they lose viewers. Every time that a company like Gillette makes an ad with a SJW agenda, they lose customers. And this is something that has happened across the board, and I am not aware of any um, exceptions to this rule. Well, now that you bring so, up guns, um, he actually points out in the column that uh, gun sales have actually undergone somewhat of a slump since the Trump presidency of course because they Americans are no longer concerned that the president of the United States is is uh, hopped up on taking their guns away. And Precisely so even correct. That he got something right. Has done more than President Obama could have done in that particular area. Let me make sure I understand this. Um, his argument is that progressive values are triumphing. And his argument is, is that gun sales are down under Trump because Americans feel more secure about keeping their guns than they did under Barack Obama. Thus achieving and, a progressive goal of reducing the number of guns sold. Well, also in achieving, achieving the impressive goal of convincing Americans for a four-year period that they don't need to ammo up against their own government. That's what that's telling me, Scott. You know, it, it, the, the idea that um, people who bought guns to protect themselves from a Barack Obama government and that kind of idea of government are buying less now because they're feeling more secure is somehow a vindication of progressive policies strikes me as the kind of thinking that gets you to be a progressive in the first place. Well, John Blake uh, also says that in a metaphorical sense, the left is ammoing up, although not with firearms. Um, well, that's the only kind of ammoing up that counts, Pat. So what, what he's saying is uh, take a look at Latinos and Asians and Muslims and women who have all rallied because of perceived attacks by the president of the United States or even when he was candidate Donald Trump against them. In 2018, a record number of females elected, record number of Muslims and females running for office, Latinos and Asians more firmly in the Democratic camp than ever. All of this redounds to the good of the Democratic Party, uh, for which John Blake seems ready to crown Donald Trump the poster child. Well, this is what they do. You, you've got to blame Trump for everything. So so you might as well blame him for um, for this uh, imagined upcoming victory as well. But let's just look at some of these numbers, OK? To say that women are rallied around Trump, the, the Democratic hold on women is has been of young single women has been overwhelming. Uh, to say that those numbers increased, I, I don't see a much of an increase to the degree that, that he has rallied people. He's rallied people who, who had never believed that there was a chance to change politics in this country and to get out of this uh, slide into statism. And, uh, and if he wants to say his team's on fire, 
uh, I think our team's on fire, too. Donald Trump wasn't on the ballot in 2018, not, at least not for uh, Republicans, he wasn't. Well, if and our the, team, meaning your team, is on fire for uh, Donald Trump, it's not showing up in congressional elections. You saw that State of the Union camera shot of the uh, both houses of Congress sitting there and the vast numbers of women on the Democratic side and the very few on the Republican side? That doesn't mean anything, Scott. How, how are these women been working out, by the way? How are the Democrats, uh, how, how much mileage are the Democrats getting pe out of like Tlaib and Omar and AOC? Are these people bringing in entire new waves of people with their sophisticated politics and their, and their realistic, uh, you know, kind of practical based grasp of reality? Or are they setting up more and more and more rockets to tell the rest of the Democrats that this party has lost its mind, has gone off the rails in terms of just being idiotic, it's gone off the rails in terms of being woke, it's gone off the rails in terms of having any idea about reality, and especially, most especially, it's gone off the rails in terms of its open, rampant anti-Semitism. So I guess time will tell, but um, this argument does not convince me. Uh, it convinces me that uh, the people at CNN are desperate to do anything they can to uh, to buck up their their uh, base, which is looking at, I guess it's been narrowed down to only 75 candidates now or whatever the number is. But nobody out there is walking away with this show. I mean, I watched, I watched, um, I, I forget her name, uh, just dissect Kamala Harris, dissect her. And then I find out a few days later, you can only imagine my surprise, that all of the records uh, dealing with um, uh, prosecution uh, and, and so on under Kamala Harris uh, as California Attorney General have somehow mysteriously been sealed. Um, so, uh, And you make reference to Tulsi Gabbard, the Democratic presidential candidate. Took, took her apart. Took her apart. And, um, and, and, and she wilted. And she wilted because nobody has been willing to face these people, most especially the press. The reason that I'm so confident is because we are fitter politically fitter than the Democrats are. We're fitter because we undergo more hardship. We listen to their arguments every day. We see it in movies, television, all over the so-called news. We get it all the time. We have to be prepared to defend our, our positions against those positions, and we have to have better arguments, and we do. These people have never had to face tough questions. Have you ever seen Barack Obama faced with a tough question? The only time I ever saw Barack Obama ever faced with a tough question was when Mitt Romney put him on the ropes and in uh, debate two, and if, Cat, uh, and if Candy Crowley hadn't hurled herself between uh, Romney and, um, and uh, the president of the uh, CNN party, then th he, he was a stammering, stumbling wreck. Donald Trump is president because he does not allow them to get away with this stuff. He puts it, he puts it back on them. Uh, you, you know, it, it, the, typically, well, I think the American people would be quite afraid if Donald Trump were president. Uh, you'd be afraid because you'd be in jail. There's never been a Republican to fight like this, ever. I want to bring up ever. two more things before we close here. Uh, one sure. is um, that John Blake on CNN.com points out that evangelical Christians have lost credibility because of their wholehearted support for an apparently amoral candidate and president. And so this is nothing but good for Democrats and progressives because uh, evangelical Christians have essentially lost the, the voice of values. Well... If evangelical Christians had uh, shown up for a guy who was very presidential in 2012, we'd be entering the second term of, um, of Mitt Romney now. But uh, they didn't show up for that one because he was a Mormon. Uh, whether or not Donald Trump suppresses that vote, I, I find pretty specious. Uh, the, the fundamental Christian vote is a vote that is based on conscience, and that's true. And there are many, many moral and ethical lapses in Donald Trump's career, and I think most people understand that. But I think they also understand that that Donald Trump is 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 at least presenting a, a future for America as a country to be proud of. And I think that strikes them as as citizens, not as Christians, but as citizens. I think that strikes them on a much larger level than whatever uh, distaste they may have for some of the man's uh, 
antics in the past. Well, I mean, not, not everybody on the right is proud of it, Bill. And this is the final point, and we've got to wrap this quickly here. But one of the things that John Blake says is that President Trump has done something that President Obama could not do, and that's the refrain throughout this article. He has done something that President could, uh, Obama could not do with regard to race, because the fact that President Obama was in the White House was a refutation of the argument that America is racist. And in fact, many people, he would say, have deluded themselves into thinking that we'd entered the post-racial area in the United States. But in fact, President uh, Trump has done the best job possible at convincing white Americans that racism is rampant in the United States. And Donald Trump accomplished this uh, national trend towards racism by making black unemployment the lowest it's ever been in history. And the gap between white and black unemployment the lowest it's ever been in history. Is this how he accomplished this racist act? I'm just telling you what John Blake said at CNN.com. Well, I'm just telling you that what John Blake at CNN.com is saying doesn't hold up to, to any, any kind of scrutiny whatsoever. Donald Trump has done more for black Americans and put more black Americans to work than, than any president in my lifetime. And whether or not he cares about that, and I suspect that he doesn't much care about it, because during the Obama administration, we saw another eight years of the total disintegration of American cities and 8,000 Americans being murdered every year in those cities without the slightest bit of concern on the part of the Democrats, who now have a toxic sludge downtown Los Angeles that's going to break out into either typhoid or bubonic plague, depending on how the situation goes. Uh, I think he's quite a deluded individual, and I'm more than happy to put uh, his vision of what America is now up against ours and see how things roll out in, um, in November of 2020. Laying out the vision of conservatism and constitutionalism five times a week, Bill Whittle now comes to you thanks to the members at BillWhittle.com. Uh, if you'd like to join their ranks and find your people, so to speak, um, in a members-only blog and comment section where there are vibrant discussions filled with reason, thoughts, civil dialogue, and lots of fun away from the toxic sewer of social media, well, then just go to BillWhittle.com and click that Become a Member link. For Bill Whittle, I'm Scott Ott. Thanks to the members for making this possible.